What's up, Wizards? It's Dev and Ziggy here from SBMTG. We like it a magic, and today's deck is one bad mother. back and I've exhausted my only good moth pun. It's the only one I could come up with. I've got stuff in my notes on my phone that say like something something flying something nocturnal. I've also just got the word duskox written in here. I don't know what I'm supposed to do with that but just because I couldn't come up with like good moth puns doesn't mean that I wasn't exactly as excited as the rest of the magic playing world when I found out there was going to be a mothra card in Ikoria. Like mothra has always been to me since I was like seven years old I've been a mothra stand. Mothra's always been like the coolest part the coolest character in the entire Godzilla franchise because I'm not going to lie when I was a little kid I was like I don't know dog Godzilla's kind of dumb I feel like it's kind of stupid I don't like it that much oh my god there's a giant moth here <laughs> suddenly I love this I don't know why I felt that way, but it kind of perfectly mirrors how I felt going through a Korea spoiler season, right? Like, oh, there's a bunch of monsters here. Godzilla shows up. Who really cares, though, y'all? I just don't, I'm not really that into this. Oh my god, there's a giant moth. <laughs> Suddenly, this is the best set ever. Also, by the way, aside from all the Mothra stuff, this also feels partially like sideways inspired by the Radiance, the final boss from Hollow Knight. If you know what I'm talking about, you're like, oh yeah, and if you don't know what I'm talking about, go play Hollow Knight. It's like, it's so, it's so good. Such a good video game. But anyway, there's that. And finally, let's not let the actual pun name of the card fly over our heads here because this luminous brood moth usually moths are attracted to light but you see this moth gives off light which is hilarious that means it's probably attracted to itself so i guess i've got something in common with it <laughs> shut up i'm pretty but anyway i've tried out a whole bunch of builds with the moth in just the last few weeks a sort of black white aristocrats type deal originally i was going to build this as a devotion deck and play reverend hoplite that wasn't very good. I even wanted to play Witch's Oven at some point in that deck so we could sacrifice our creatures at will. That was also terrible. It literally does nothing, so don't play that version of the deck. But then eventually I landed on a sort of life gain deck, and which can be seen right here. But this deck is just mono white life gain with Luminous Broodmoth. That's kind of boring. That's a little, a little bit boring. So what we actually landed on here was a much more sort of aggro-oriented build that tries to pile on damage as quickly as possible and use Luminous Broodmoth as a piece that allows us to swing through for combat damage without having to worry about the crackback. If our opponents block our creatures, that's fine. They'll end up untapped and with flying, so they can either block when it's our opponent's turn, or if we can just survive until our next turn, we can get through with creatures that now fly. That means a few things. We have to play a reasonably low curve in the deck. I'm topping out at four with Luminous Broodmoth, and it's our only four drop. I want to devote as many early slots to creatures as possible so that we can leverage this into immediate impact the turn it hits the table on curve if at all possible. Now in turn, that means that we have to play a relatively high number of one-drop creatures because we want a one-drop in pretty much every game, and in some games we want two one-drops on turn two. I ended up on ten one-drops, and originally I was playing double that number, but that didn't prove to be quite so great, so <laughs> I've pared it down to half that number and only the best one-drops for the deck, for my estimation at least. We ended up on four copies of Venerable Knight, two copies of Hunted Witness, and four copies of All Seed of Life's Bounty, All, all Side... All Sade. I, this card's been out for a few months and I'm still not sure I'm pronouncing it right, but all I'm saying in is that this can protect a creature, often Luminous Broodmoth, from removal, and then protect it again <laughs> the next turn. It kind of turns itself into a healer's hawk if you have a Broodmoth out. And very often, Broodmoth has this huge target on its back, so it's nice to have this one mana piece that can protect it up to two times, but it can protect any important creature if you want it to. It can get a creature through for almost guaranteed combat damage as well. There's a lot of cool things that All Seed can do, while also hitting for a little bit of damage in the early game as well. But there's also two copies of Hunted Witness, which was originally four copies of Hunted Witness. I wanted to play as many of these creatures that have some sort of afterlife effect as possible, but in the end, Hunted Witness just wasn't as impactful as a creature like Venerable Knight that has the Savannah Lion stat line that's very aggressive. And since we're trying to get damage as quickly as possible and count the 20 as fast as we can in most games, it just really helps to have a creature with an aggressive stat line like Venerable Knight more than it does to have creatures like All Seed and Hunted Witness that only swing for one damage, which just isn't enough if they're your only creatures on the table. Again, we're trying to be really aggressive here, and that means that we pretty much have to play four copies of Venerable Knight because it's the most aggressive stat line in white right now. 
But moving into the two drops here, we're also playing 10 two drop creatures in the deck, starting with four copies of Tithe Taker. This is one of the afterlife effects that I absolutely had to keep. I love the sort of taxes effect this card has. If your opponent wants to do anything to you or your dudes on your turn, it's going to cost them. If it does die while you have a Brood Moth out, you not only get the 1 1 flyer, but you also get your Tithe Taker back with flying. And when it dies, you get another 1 1 flyer. Afterlife effects are, in fact, insanely good in this deck. I just wanted them on decently stacked creatures. But we're also playing four copies of Charming Prince, one of the few creatures with an ETB trigger in this deck. Amazingly enough, you'd think ETB triggers would be one of the big reasons you'd want to play Luminous Broodmoth, but Mono White doesn't have access to all the best ETBs. It's got some really good dies triggers, like Hunted Witness and Tithe Taker and whatnot, but I wish we had some more ETBs. As it stands, Charming Prince is one of the better ones we could play by a long shot. This does so many things for the deck, even little techie things, but for the most part, this is going to gain you three life either in the early game or sometimes even the late game just make sure you get an extra turn in one way or the other this is going to scry to make sure you get to that luminous brood moth you didn't start the game with in your hand very important function of the card right there but other times it'll reset a creature that has a flying counter on it you don't do this very often but sometimes you want a creature to be able to die again and come back again and if it's got a flying counter on it it can't do that so sometimes you'll blink a tithe taker or something like that to get the flying counter off of it and make sure it can die again to get extra value in the form of an afterlife token so again you're not going to do that very often but it's a nice little nice little slice of tech to have access to but to finish off the two drops, let's talk about a card that I did not expect to make it into the main deck. I'm really surprised that Eidolon of Obstruction is actually here. Originally all four copies were in the sideboard. But turns out that even in like best of one situations, you really need like at least the two of Eidolon in the main deck to fight Teferi, which this does very well. But obviously this helps fight like every other Planeswalker in the format, Nissa, Luka, that can be very important sometimes. So just putting your opponent off by one turn on their curve, huge deal. Not being able to activate a Planeswalker the turn they play it, again, if they played it on curve, huge deal. And even on some turns, when they top deck a Planeswalker, they have all the mana in the world, but they want to be able to cast the planeswalker activated and cast another spell this can hold them off v relatively late in the game so this has been a pretty important card for gaining a little bit of tempo and a little bit of tempo goes a very long way but let's move into the three drops here and i've actually only got one more creature to talk about in the main deck but all the rest of the cards in the main deck are three drops just so you know the and the more you know right? But anyway, we're going to talk about Lava Brink Adventurer here. The only four of three drop creature in the deck. Now, again, if you're building life game, feel free to throw in Lindens. There's a few things you could do in this slot, but for my money, Lava Brink Adventurer is probably the actual best card in the deck that's not named Luminous Broodmoth. <laughs> Seriously, depending on the board state, the turn this comes down, this is either an impenetrable blocker or it's a super reliable beat stick, right? It's either going to be your most reliable source of damage or it's going to be your best way of holding down the fort until you can get something a little bit better going on your board stack. But we're also playing four copies of Heraldic Banner in this deck, which solves some problems, right? Earlier I was talking about how we don't have the most aggressive stat lines in the world in the one-drop slot. We got a bunch of 1-1s one and stuff. Hunted Witness leaves behind a 1-1, one -one, you know. Um, Tithe Taker leaves behind a 1-1. One -one. And our two-drops aren't very aggressively statted either. You know, we got a 2-1 and a 2-2 and a 2-1 with first strike. Just not super impressive stat lines for the mana cost like all the way up and down the curve in this deck so heraldic banner helps out an awful lot if we're again trying to count to 20 as quickly as possible and we are plus you know when we have luminous brood moth out we attack with a bunch of small dudes they'll all come back with flying and having a bunch of slightly pumped dudes with flying can sometimes put the game out right then and there plus there are going to be some games where you know you you get three lands and you can play heraldic banner and then the next turn, you don't draw your fourth land, but you can still play your Luminous Brood Moth, and that can be an important line of play as, as well. This makes sure that Lava Brink Venturer gets through for four damage if it can go unblocked due to its protection. That's very important. It can also get, like, Eidolon of Obstruction's power up to three, and a three-power First Striker is very, very good a lot of the time. Like, unbelievably good some of the time. This makes the tokens that Hunted Witness and High Taker leave behind a lot bigger. So, there's just so many cool things Heraldic Banner does in the deck, and it really makes, you know, it makes sure that we can close in games where we otherwise would not be able to close at all. <laughs> 
But the final card in the deck is the four copies of Banishing Light, which we need. I was only on two copies of Banishing Light. Then I went up to three copies of Banishing Light. And then I'm playing, now I'm playing four. And if I could play five, I might. You need something that's just catch-all, all-purpose removal that can take out that thing that's screwing your plan up. So you'll almost always be happy to draw a Banishing Light. Right? So, I ended up on four copies of this card because we need some kind of removal. Now, we're playing 24 lands in this deck. Really simple mana base here. Just some Arden Veil and some Plains. And Arden Veil is awesome, by the way, with Heraldic Banner. I just want to throw that out. We don't have a whole lot of ways to sink extra mana in this deck. So, sometimes Arden Veil is just insanely good, you know. <laughs> Holds down the fort. Make sure that we have a blocker every turn. Or, against, like, control decks, make sure we have an attacker every turn. Just Arden Veil... Always such a key card. It's so good. It's it's so good. But anyway, enough gushing about that. 24 lands looks like a bit much, but we have to make sure that we get to Luminous Broodmoth because it's the most important card in the deck. It's the whole reason that we built it in sitting on three lands and no Heraldic Banner and just staring at a Luminous Broodmoth that would otherwise win us the game is not a good time. If you want to have fun playing Magic, don't do that. Play 24 lands. Make sure that you get to your Broodmoth. Now here's our unbelievably important sideboard. I, I swear to you, I have not made a deck with a sideboard this important in quite some time. We've got two copies of Disenchant in here. And that is just, you know, again, catch-all. We want to be able to blow up artifacts and enchantments at instant speed, if at all possible. The fact that this can blow up Witches' Ovens and Embercleave makes it a little bit better than cards that exclusively blow up enchantments. So, ended up on Disenchant for, again, a little bit, a little bit of catch-all stuff going on. But we're also playing the other two copies of Eidolon of Obstruction, for when we know we're playing against a bunch of Planeswalkers. We've got four whole copies of Bounty Agent. This is mostly against legendary creatures, of which there are a fair amount in this deck. You know, or in, in standard, we can take out Kenriths and whatnot with this. It could sometimes be a very important card. And if we do kill a Kenrith or some other legendary with it, it'll just come back with flying if we have a Broodmoth out, which is dope. So this can also kill an Ember Cleave at instant speed and save the game for us. So I do like me some Bounty Agent a lot. We've also got a four copies of Dranith Magistrate. When we're playing against Companions, which we so often are, this card will come in. It's an all-star against Companions and Escape stuff like Euro. This can just... I'm telling you, Dranith Magistrate's good enough to maybe be in the main deck. It's, it's seriously amazing. But we've also got some Apostle of Purifying Light in there. This is amazing against any deck with, that heavily relies on black stuff, obviously. But this is also another way to combat escape things and other ways of getting creatures out of the graveyard. And just any, any graveyard strategy. This combats pretty well by also being, you know... A sometimes unblockable creature that comes back with flying if it wasn't unblockable to begin with. <laughs> it's just, it's a, it's a good card. And I wanted to, I was excited to play it in the sideboard. It's impressed me in games where it does come in. But aside from that, there's also a Cavalier of Dawn. The only thing that goes above Luminous Broodmoth on curve in the entire deck. But if we are going to play a fifth copy of Banishing Light, I think this is probably the best way to do it. And here are your power rankings. A final score of 65. The actual lowest score of any deck we've teched so far this season by one point but it's, it's not a terrible deck but i will say that there were times when playtesting this deck especially in best of one was a pain serious pain you might notice that this is the first deck in a very long time um for for this to happen where you actually have a higher post board score than game one score that very rarely happens with some of the decks that we that we do here on the channel but this is one of those times where once you get into your sideboard for games two and three you can really fine-tune some of the stuff you're doing put in those Dranith healers put in those apostles put in those eidolons to nerf those planeswalkers it's very very important that you you know play this deck in best of three but honestly even in best of three it gets bested of three a fair amount of the time by some of the more powerful decks in the format but there are decks that this combats fairly well. Ironically, one of the decks I've had the best time against is pretty much any Fires of Invention deck. I have been just stomping, but there's been a fair amount of other decks in the format, like Winota, um, Giruda, these turn four I win decks and stuff that have been stomping me. Other aggro-oriented decks like Mono Red and the Mono Black deck that plays Heraldic Banner are in some ways much better and, and get more card advantage late game in different ways than we do. So, um, Or just have like more impactful, punchy closers like Embercleave and whatnot. So we're kind of stuck in this weird place where we're not 
not aggro, we're not mid-range, we lose to some of the mid-range decks, we lose the control decks, we lose to some of the aggro decks, but we're very fine-tuned to beat some of the decks that just play nothing but sweepers, right? Fires of Invention decks that play Shatter the Sky and Deafening Clarion, we tend to be very good against so long as we can get down that Luminous Broodmoth. But even if we don't have Broodmoth, we have things like Tithe Taker, we have Hunted Witness to leave creatures behind when the opponent does sweep us. So we have a fair amount of anti-sweeper tech in the deck, and we perform very well against decks that rely very heavily on sweepers to set their plans up. So sometimes those games can feel very good, but especially until you get to the sideboard, things can get a little bit iffy in game one. So this is not one of the better best of one decks that I've done. It also has the problem of being an aggro deck that can't aggro until it gets its heraldic banner, and then it's like all your creatures have appropriate stats once once you hit your heraldic banner, <laughs> right? But I will say when the deck does set up the proper sequence, it gets heraldic banner, it gets luminous brood moth, then those two cards actually sort of combo kind of well, it doesn't seem like a combo but as long as you have like four or five creatures on the battlefield you attack aggressively with the creatures that do die on blocks will come right back with flying and be bigger because of heraldic banner and sometimes there's really not much an opponent can do about you setting up that late game plan even if they have big creatures and stuff so you know we have stuff like hunted witness where it'll come back as a 2-1 if you have a heraldic banner out it'll come back as a 2-1 with flying but also leave behind a token that can block on the crack back from your opponent so there's just a lot of like really cool things this deck does but it needs like all of its good cards out at the same time to do those cool things and that's not going to happen all the time especially in a deck that doesn't really have a way of drawing cards if we have a good way of generating card advantage in this deck it's just luminous brood moth and even then your opponent has to block the way you want them to so there are weird things about this deck and i'm not going to pretend it's the best deck we've done all season but you know, at the same time, it can be a very fun deck to play. If you're going to play Mono White Aggro, I think this might be one of the better ways of doing it because Broodmoth is a very strong sort of finishing move for this deck. So give it a shot. See how you like it. This is a fun deck to play, but it does have its issues. Just let me know how you feel about it down there in the comments section, how we could improve the deck, anything you'd like to play sort of increase the aggression. Or maybe you think it's better to cut back on the aggression, play more five drops like Hoplite. Reverend Hoplite, Cavalier of Dawn, you know, make it a more sort of controly kind of deck. I didn't really like that when I did it. I kind of like the aggro route, but just tell me how you feel. Because, I'm again, I'm not going to say this deck's going to win every matchup, but it does win some matchups that are very, very important in this standard, and that's got to count for something. But let me know how you do it differently in the comments section. And remember to do all the other stuff, too, you know. Like the video that helps me out within the algorithm. I need I need that right about now. I do. Subscribe to me. That really helps me out because I get more views because you'll... They'll actually tell you when I put videos out. Rather than like every six months, you're like, I wonder what that, that SVMTG guy is up to. No, just subscribe to the channel <laughs> and hit the bell for the notifications. If you really want to support the channel, check out the Patreon. Dollar a month is all I ask. And that'll let you vote on what content you even want to see around here. You know, this deck smashed the Patreon poll by like double its nearest competitor. Right, but there's plenty of polls this season where like just a couple of votes would have really swung things. So dollar a month is all I ask. Get in there. And aside from that, if you're interested in this deck list, check out the link in the description to TCG Player. That'll take you to the deck list on their side. You can order anything you need. And when you do, it helps you do out. So do all that stuff. It's your turn to, to do things. You don't actually have to do any things. I'm just, I'm just glad that you're here. I'm glad that you are here, my friend. But anyway, I guess I'm done for this one. I'll be playing it on camera soon along with a bunch of other wacky stuff. I got a bunch of cool ideas. But before we do any of that, we got to do a tier list video. The, the version one tier list for Aquaria Standard. That should be out in a couple of days. So if you want to subscribe for no other reason, subscribe for that. So I guess I'll see you all in a couple of days. I've been Deb from the place. Thanks for watching, my wizards. Spread love and be kind.